Hello everyone, I am Priyanka Wilson and welcome to GSS course series of decoding the UPSC syllabus with macro topic detailing. This is the last video in the series of decoding the history of the syllabus by Rashid Yasin sir. In this session, he will be dealing with modern history part of the history of the syllabus with macro topic detailing and mapping them with previous year questions. So guys, stay tuned for the next other videos in this series and if you like this video, so please like, share and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon for regular updates. Thank you. Hello everyone. Today we'll start with the syllabus explanation of paper 2 of history optional of UPSC mains examination. In the previous two videos, I have explained the syllabus of paper 1, including ancient and medieval Indian history. Today, we'll start with paper 2. The first section is modern India. Clear? Modern India starts with the arrival of European companies to India, and these European companies began to fight among themselves and also with Indian powers, and ultimately, British emerged to be victorious who ruled till the middle of the 20th century over Indian territory. Clear? The first topic that is mentioned under modern Indian history is European penetration in India. And within this topic, they have mentioned Portuguese, the Dutch, the English and the Carnatic wars that were fought among themselves and then Indian provinces like Bengal. Clear? First European power to arrive in India were the Portuguese. Among the Portuguese, Vasco da Gama invented sea route towards India. He came to India in 1498, that is by the end of the 15th century. And thereafter, Portuguese traders began to dominate the western coast of India. Some of them maintained healthy relationship with Indian powers also like the ruler of Vijayanagar, Krishnadevaraya. But they introduced a kind of force whereby they wanted to dominate Indian trade. After Portuguese, the Dutch came to India in 1602, but in course of time, Dutch shifted towards Southeast Asia and they began to trade with islands of Java and Sumatra. Another European power to come to India were the English merchants and traders. The English merchants and traders began to arrive in India around the beginning of the 17th century and they began to dominate over Indian territory. The English were followed by the French traders who came to India in the second half of the 17th century. Both British and French who wanted to dominate over Indian territory and trade, they began to fight among themselves. That resulted into three decisive battles between the British and the French which is termed as the Carnatic Wars because these wars were fought in the region of Carnatic in the southern part of India. He, ultimately in these Carnatic Wars, French were defeated and English emerged to be victorious into trade with Indian territory. Not only among European powers, English the East India Company, as the company was formed to trade with India, began to enter into conflict with major Indian powers, the most prominent province being the province of Bengal in eastern India. Clear? Bengal at this time, by the middle of the 18th century, was being ruled by a very powerful and ruler that is Suraj Udola. British wanted to impose their own system on Suraj Udola, but he did not accept those provisions and ultimately a decisive battle between British, East India Company and Suraj was fought at the battlefield of Plassey in 1757. Due to betrayal of major persons like Mi Jaffa, who was the commander-in-chief of Bengal army, Siraj was defeated and after Siraj was defeated in 1757, Mir Jafar became the next Nawab of Bengal. Mir Jafar could rule only for three years and was followed by Mir Qasim in 1760. As a result of the Battle of Plassey, British were able to gain control over the province of Bengal, which was the most prosperous province of India, and they began to drain Bengal of its rich resources, which enabled British to conquer other parts of Indian territory. These are the topics mentioned and the European penetration into India. Now we look into that some questions that which has been asked from this topic by UPSC examination. The topic, the question is, the Battle of Plassey was not a great battle, but a great betrayal. Obviously, asked in 2000. The Battle of Plassey was not a great battle. The reason being, 
that battle lasted only for a few hours as most of the Bengal army did not participate under the guidance of the commander in chief Mir Jafar along with other important persons of Bengal like Jagat Sage and that is why because of the betrayal of Bengal army and commander in chief Bengal army was defeated in the battle of Plassey, Bela Plassey and therefore it was a kind of betrayal or treachery rather than a major battle. Okay. Next question is Duplex made a cardinal blunder in looking for the key of India and Madras. Clive sought and fought in Bengal, critically examined. I'll let you know. As we had discussed, the British East India Company and French East India Company fought three Carnatic wars in the southern part of India. Brit French fortune was largely revived in India under Duplex, who was the governor of French East India Company. Duplex wanted to defeat British in the southern part of India and he focused largely on the regions of Pondicherry. But at the same time, when British established control over Bengal under Robert Clive after the Battle of Plassey, the rich resources of Bengal, both in men and material, enabled Robert Clive to defeat French forces in the Carnatic War. That is why it is rightly said that Duplex made a cardinal blunder looking for the key of India and Madras, southern part of India. Clive sought and fought it in Bengal at this time. The rich resource of Bengal only enabled Clive to defeat French East India Company in the Carnatic War. These are some questions asked in the previous year of UPSC examination. Moving on to the next topic of modern Indian history in UPSC syllabus is British expansion in India. Clear? And in this British expansion, again, the first province is Bengal. As we had discussed, after defeating Siraj Udola, British declared Mir Jafar to be the next Nawab of Bengal. Mir Jafar could rule only for three years from 1757 till 1760. And after Mir Qasim, Mir Jafar, Mir Qasim was declared to be the next Nawab of Bengal. Mir Qasim was basically a powerful ruler and he could not play into the hands of the British. Therefore, British removed Mir Qasim also in 1763 and in order to take revenge from British, Mir Qasim made a triple alliance with the ruler of Awadh as well as the as well as the as well as Mughal Emperor. And the three Indian powers clashed with the British in the battlefield of Baksar and Bihar in 1764. Even in this battle, British defeated the Indian powers that proved to be highly decisive in nature. So after Battle of Plassey, Battle of Baksar proved to be quite decisive in nature. At the same time, British fought, British expanded in India, not only in Bengal, but in other parts of India. In the southern part of India, British wanted to establish control over the province of Mysore which was effectively ruled by Hyder Ali and his son and successor Tipu Sultan. Both Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan tried to defend Mysore against British expansion and therefore it resulted into four Anglo-Mysore wars and ultimately due to these wars Mysore forces were defeated and Mysore was also conquered by British authority. After Mysore, British even wanted to establish control over Marathas, which were under the command of the Peshwas in the 18th and 19th century. Clear? British wanted to establish control over Marathas to gain mastery over the western coast of India, which was under the control. That resulted into three major wars between the Marathas and the British, which is also known as the Three Anglo-Maratha Wars. And as a result of internal dissensions and conflict among Marathas, Marathas were also also defeated by the British that resulted into control over large parts of Indian territory. After the Marathas, British even decided to control over the northwestern province of Punjab, which was ruled effectively in the beginning of 19th century by Maharaja Ranjit Singh. British adopted a different approach here. British never wanted to re defeat Maharaja Ranjit Singh. They respected Maharaja Ranjit Singh and Treaty of Amritsar or Friendship Treaty was signed with Maharaja Ranjit Singh. But just after the death of Maharaja Ranjit Singh in 1839, weak successors began to rule over Punjab and British were forced to conquer Punjab as a result of two Anglo-Sikh wars which were fought by the middle of the 19th century. Therefore, Punjab was also annexed by the British and it was annexed under the able leadership of Lord Dalhousie, the Governor General of British in India at this time. With this, large parts of Indian territory came under the British authority. British expanded radically and they became the most powerful authority in India to capitalize on Indian resources and territory. This was second topic. Now, some questions which has been asked from this topic is 
The Treaty of Basin, by its direct and indirect operations, gave the company the empower of India. Treaty of Basin was signed between the British and the Maratha, that is the Peshwa at Pune. As per Treaty of Basin, British were allowed to maintain their troops in the territory of the Marathas, and therefore British was unable to gain control over internal affairs of the Marathas. That is why it is said that Treaty of Basin, by its direct and indirect operations, gave the company the empire of India. Why? Because only Marathas were left to be powerful authority. And after defeating Marathas, no Indian power was capable enough to challenge the British. So, with Treaty of Basin, not only British gained control over Marathas, but British indirectly got the empire of India as well, as Marathas were the most powerful authority ruling over Indian territory. Next question The British fought the first Maratha war in a period when their fortunes were at the lowest step. British fought the first Maratha war in the year in 1775. And this war went up to 1782, that is for seven years. Why it is said that British fought the first Maratha war in a period when their fortunes were at the lowest ebb? Because when they started this war in 1775 till 1782, British were facing challenges in the another colony that is America. American War of Independence had started and British were defeated by the Native Americans at that time and therefore America became independent with its 13 colonies. Therefore this happened at this phase only and British, British fortunes were at lowest step outside India. Within India also I'll let you know not only the Maratha War, British were fighting with the Mysore at this point of time in the second Anglo-Mysore War. And till 1782 British could not defeat Mysore also. First they could not defeat Hadar Ali and second they could not defeat his son and successor Tipu Sultan. That is why it is likely said the British fought the first Maratha war in this period when the fortunes were at lowest ebb. Both in India as well as outside India the fortunes were not in their favor and in this war they fought war which whereby they showed their resilience that enabled them to retain their hold over Indian territory. This was the second topic the questions asked from this second topic. Now we'll move on to the third major topic of our syllabus, the early structure of the British art. British art, Diary, Regulating Act, Pitts India Act, Charter Acts, Free Trade and English Utilitarians. I'll let you know. Basically, when British established their control over the province of Bengal, they established a kind of authority or government which is known as the dual system of government. What was this dual system of government? According to this dual system of government, British enjoyed all authority over the province of Bengal. But they never wanted to share any responsibility. The responsibility was with the Nawab of Bengal, that is Mir Jafar. Clear? So, no all authority without any responsibility, that was the case with British. And with respect to Bengal of Nawab, they had all the responsibility without any authority. And two authorities began to rule over Bengal. One with full authority, another with only only semblance of authority, and two authorities ruling over the same province at the single time. It is known as dual system of administration, which was established in Bengal. And during this phase, British exploited the resources of Bengal that led to plunder of Bengal resources, and therefore Bengal faced a very severe famine in 1770 that was the almost one third of the total population of Bengal. Therefore, British authority or the rule of British India Company began to be questioned in British Parliament and that is why it resulted into a kind of regulation of a British India Company in India and that resulted into enactment of the Regulating Act in the year 1773. This regulating act was passed in the year 1773 to regulate or control the affairs of a private trading company that is British East India Company by British parliamentarians in London. Several provisions were enacted at this in the regulating act but this regulating act could not be very productive in long term and therefore a need arose to enact another act in order to rule over or regularize the activities of British authority in India. Therefore British parliamentarians enacted another major act in 1784 known as the Pitts India Act. It was passed during the regime of Pitts the Younger, the British Prime Minister and therefore the act itself was named as Pitts India Act. The Pitts India Act tried to rectify the errors of the Regulating Act and to ensure proper administration in the province of 
Bengal. Thereafter, British authority decided that in coming time, regular acts must be enacted with respect to India to ensure better administration. This resulted into charter acts enacted by British parliamentarians. The first charter act to be enacted by British parliamentarians was in the year 1793. And it was also made clear that these charter acts need to be reviewed after every 20 years. Therefore, after enacting the first Charter Act in 1793, British enacted another Charter Act in the year 1813, whereby the monopoly of British East India Company over Indian trade was abolished and free trade was promoted with respect to India. And this was demanded even by English utilitarians who believed in greatest good of greatest number of people. Next Charter Act was passed in the year 1833, that is after two decades, 20 years. And in this Charter Act of 1833, British mono, uh, monopoly of British India Company over India trade was completely abolished as even items like trade in tea and trade with China were taken out of their command. These Charter Acts led to further changes in Indian administration. And all these were largely facilitated by the concept of free trade as monopoly of British India Company was to be abolished and English utilitarians demanded that there should be equal participation of all British members over Indian trade. All these developments took place as early structure of British Raj in India. Now we look into the prop, prop major questions asked from this topic. Clear? Clear? The British Indian state experienced the wind of change with the arrival of Lord William Bentley. In the class, we'll discuss arrival of several Governor Generals of Bengal and Governor Generals of India and among them there was a very progressive person who came to India as Governor General of Bengal. This person was Lord William Bentick and Lord William Bentick was introduced several reforms in India that resulted into wind of change with arrival of this person. Lord William Bentick first of all passed a law to abolish the ancient Indian custom of Sati whereby widow was forced to bury, forced to uh, fire themselves or rather burn themselves on the funeral part of the husband. Lord William Bentick even wanted to reform Indian education system whereby it resulted into controversy between Anglicist and the Orientalist. Anglicists wanted to promote English education, Orientalists wanted to continue with traditional education in India. Lord William Bentick even promoted the system of commissionerate in India, where commissioners were formed in order to ensure proper provincial administration in India. All this resulted into wind of change with the arrival of Lord William Bentick. Okay. Next question is the Regulating Act 1773, the Pitts India Act 1784 and eventually the Charter Act of 1833 left this India company as a mere shadow of its earlier political economic power in India. As we discussed right from the Regulating Act of 1773, as the word regulating itself indicate, British Parliament in sitting back in London wanted to reduce the power, the monopoly of the British East India Company India. And with this only they began to enact laws in British parliamentarians. The first being the Regulating Act of 1773, where the British authority was forced, or British India Company was forced to report their activities to British parliamentarians in London. At the same time, Governor General was given the authority to look after the administration of Bengal, and at the same time, he was to be appointed by, he was to be appointed with the consent of British parliamentarians. In the Pitts India Act, they further tried to reduce the power and authority of British East India Company, which got further reduced in course of Charter Acts of 1813, 1833 and by the Charter Act of 1833, East India Company's monopoly over Indian trade was also taken away and they were left as a mere shadow of its earlier political and economic power. Major power began to be confined in the hands of British parliamentarians in London. These are few major questions asked from this topic. Now we'll move on to the next major topic of modern India that is economic impact of British rule. Now I'll let you know. Clear? This topic is one of the most important topic of history optional respect with respect to modern India. You are bound to get question every year from this policy because major impact of British rule was seen in the economic sphere for a long period of time. And within economic impact, the first major topic is land revenue settlement that is permanent settlement, Rautwari settlement and Mahalwari settlement. I'll let you know clear. With the arrival of British in India, especially in the province of Bengal, British wanted to collect fixed amount of revenue and therefore they came out with a new revenue settlement in the province of Bengal known as permanent settlement in the year 1793 whereby land revenue was fixed on a permanent basis, permanent basis as they wanted to ensure 
regular supply of revenue but land revenue be, by being fixed on permanent basis was not a feasible idea in India because Indian agriculture has always been dependent on climatic conditions like rain which is totally variable in nature. After permanent settlement could not lead to better result, they came out with Rayotwari settlement in the provinces of Madras and Bombay. It was introduced in the year 1820 whereby land revenue was to be collected directly from the peasants of the Rayot rather than by middlemen that is zamindars and the permanent settlement. Rayotwari settlement proved to be highly exploitative in nature that resulted in huge reactions from the peasantry class. Next was the Mahalwari settlement introduced in the province of Punjab and the northern plains of India and in this Mahalwari settlement land revenue was to be collected by a local agent amounting to one third of the total produce. This land revenue settlement was was quite liberal as compared to permanent and worldwide settlement it could be sustained for a relatively longer period of time but all these fixed land revenue settlements affected the peasantry class it led to huge resentment and that resentment got an outburst in the form of the mighty revolt of 1857 not only land revenue settlement british wanted to earn maximum revenue from india and therefore they even went for commercialization of agriculture whereby Apart from cultivation of food grains, British forced Indian peasants to cultivate certain cash crops whereby huge benefit could be accrued. And this cash crops included cultivation of indigo, cultivation of opium, cultivation of other products as well. All these products resulted in huge benefits to British authority but at the same time affected the agriculture production in India. And due to this only, famine became a recurrent feature of Indian society. Apart just because of commercialization of agriculture, it resulted into landless agrarian labors. Just because of land revenue settlements, ownership rights of peasants were abolished, and those peasants who lost their ownership rights, they became agrarian laborers or landless agrarian laborers in India, which was a new phenomenon not witnessed in ancient and medieval history, medieval history in Indian history or Indian, Indian system. Apart from this, just because agriculture got affected, landless agrarian laborers emerged, emerged, it resulted into impoverishment of rural society, famines became a regular feature and that affected masses in all major forms. Apart from these topics, under British economic policy, we'll look into other important aspects, dislocation of traditional trade and commerce. The trade and commerce that was continuing in India with the traditional products, it lost its market because traditional handicrafts were abolished. At the same time, whatever cottage industries existed in India, those cottage industries were closed. Large factories were set up by British that resulted in deindustrialization. Moreover, British took all the resources from India, went back to Europe or Europe and invested the amount there. It resulted in one-sided flow of wealth from India to Britain, which is also termed as grain of wealth. That was highlighted very well by an Indian economist, Dada by Noroji. And all these factors result into economic transformation of India. India being a self-sufficient economy got converted into dependent economy under British. Rail, road and communication network were provided promoted by British while just to satisfy the commercial greed. British were the first to introduce rail in India and the first railway line was led between Bombay and Thane in 1853. But railways served not Indian purpose. Railways were basically to collect raw materials from remote areas and at the same time supply finished products to Indian market so as to make India dependent on British manufactured goods. At the same time, communication network, which was telegraph line, was laid in India in order to ensure proper coordination and to prevent any major occurrence of revolt or rebellion. All these resulted into famine and poverty among Indian masses, and European business enterprise served only the commercial interest, not the interest of India. That is why it is said that economically, India was paralyzed altogether under the rule of British East India Company. So the effect was largely visible in the economic sphere. We'll look into some questions asked from in the previous year related to this topic. Trace the circumstances that led to the introduction of permanent settlement in Bengal. Discuss its impact on landlords, peasants and government. Circumstances that led to introduction of permanent settlement were, first of all, British wanted to ensure fixed amount of revenue collection and therefore they wanted to have permanent fixation of land revenue. This resulted into permanent settlement in Bengal. However, the permanent settlement could not serve this purpose because they realized that the revenue amount of one third was too low to be collected from the peasantry class. 
its impact on landlords. Landlords benefited largely at this time because landlords acted as the intermediaries between the British and the peasants to collect the land revenue. Peasantry class largely remained to be affected because land revenue fixed on permanent basis affected their own source of income. But at the same time, they were able to manage and therefore rebellion and revolt would take place. And the government, government benefited with a fixed source of income, but at the same time, government realized that fixing the revenue on permanent basis was not a fruitful idea as large amount of benefit was benefit remained under the control of the peasantry class. Next is our system acts very much like a sponge, drawing up all the good things from the banks of the Ganges and squeezing them down on the banks of Thames. This was a remark given by British officer only John Sullivan and it was given basically to explain the concept of drain of wealth. As we had discussed that huge amount of resources were taken from India and invested in Europe and Britain that resulted into impoverishment of India. There was said our system, that is system of drain of wealth acts very much like a sponge that is drawing up all the good things from the banks of the Ganges that is taking up all the resources from India and squeezing them, uh, them down on the banks of Thames. Thames that is a river in Britain that means all resources were taken unilaterally from India and deposited in Britain and Europe just to benefit the European powers and British especially. Therefore this indicated the concept of unilateral, unilateral flow of wealth known as the drain of wealth. This was economic impact of British colonial rule. Now we'll move on to the fifth topic of modern India that is social and cultural developments. Now, under social and cultural developments, first of all, we look into dislocation of indigenous education, orientalist and Englishist controversy, Western education. Clear? First of all, I'll, I'll let you know when British came to India, they never wanted to introduce English education. They wanted to continue with the indigenous education in India, which was imparted to Indian students through the medium of either Sanskrit language or Persian language. In fact, some British officers like Warren Hastings established traditional in institutions like Calcutta Madarsa and Sanskrit College at Banaras. Okay? But with arrival of Lord William Bentick, who was very progressive in nature, the need was felt to introduce English education. This need was also felt basically to create lower cadre of British or Indian officers who could work in the British system. And without English no knowledge of English, that was not possible. So they wanted to introduce elementary English education in India. Lord William Bentick therefore to promote, they wanted to introduce new system of education. This resulted into controversy among British officers only, those British officers who supported traditional education but termed as Orientalist, and those British officers who supported English education but termed as Anglicist. In order to resolve this conflict, Lord William Bentick appointed a committee under the chairmanship of Lord Macaulay. And Lord Macaulay in 1835 gave recommendation whereby he supported Anglicist viewpoint that is to introduce English education in India. This was major development with respect to education and this resulted into the introduction of Western education in India. With the introduction of Western education, growth and development of press also took place, but press is still largely remained to be in vernacular languages of India. Along with this, certain amount of progress of science also began to take place because British began to question the traditional and outdated practices of India like Sati. And they began to introduce modern system in India, modern thinking in India. So progress of science began to take place to a limited extent. And in this major role was played by Christian missionaries. Christian missionaries wanted to promote English education in India. Christian missionaries wanted to support the in support the uh, support the orphans in India, the women in India, and all these activities even resulted to large scale conversions to Christianity as well, especially among the tribal people of India. These were social and cultural developments. Now, what major questions has been asked in the previous year? Review the education policy of the English East India Company. To what extent did it serve the imperial interest? British review, English education, education policy, we have discussed that initially they wanted to continue with traditional education in India, but later on they shifted to English education or Western education in India. And why they wanted? Because they wanted to serve imperial interest, because they wanted low 
paid officers or clerks in India so that with English education, their cost of administration could be reduced as they had to bring English educated clerks and officers from Britain. If Indians could be given primary education in English, they could work on low salaries and therefore the cost of administration could be economized. So it largely served the imperial interest of Britain in the short run. But in the long run, this English education created a class of awakened Indians and these awakened Indians began to question British rule itself and that ultimately resulted into the end of British rule in India. So British authority was questioned by educated Indians, English, English education in course of time. What was the significance of the Orientalist Anglicist controversy in the 19th century? The significance was ultimately Anglicist viewpoint prevailed on the recommendation of Macaulay Committee and that resulted to English education or Western education in India and that went a long way towards modernization of Indian society and culture. These are few questions asked from this topic. Now we'll move on to the sixth major topic of modern India and the sixth major topic is social and religious reform movements. Again, I'll let you know bound to get question from this topic clear that is social and religious reform movements in india clear first of all under social religious reform movements in bengal we'll discuss about raja ram mohan roy and started a movement known as brahma samaj or brahma movement then debin Tagore, ishwar chand vidya sagar young bengal movement and dhanan saraswati clear raja ram mohan roy is considered to be the pioneer of Indian Renasa. He is also considered to be father of modern India because he is the first person to start the social and religious reform movements in India. Raja Ram Mohan Roy first of all started a campaign against the practice of Sati. Raja Ram Mohan Roy even supported some Europeans to promote English education in India. During his with support only, Hindu college was established in Calcutta. Raja Ram Mohan Roy himself established Vedanta College to promote education among Indians. Raja Ram Mohan Roy was the pioneer of political education. Raja Ram Mohan Roy was pioneer of press because he was well versed with different languages of India. And finally, Raja Ram Mohan Roy established a religious reform movement to purify Hinduism. And this religious reform movement was Brahm Sabha, which was established in 1828, to be converted into Brahm Samaj in 1829. It even marked the beginning of a movement known as Brahmo movement. After the death of Raja Ram Mohan Roy in 1833, no major person was there to lead Brahmo movement. And ultimately, this challenge was taken by another reformer of Bengal, Debendra Nath Tagore. And Debendra Nath Tagore was already having his own organization known as Tattva Bodhini Sabha. Debin Nartago combined the Tattva Bodhini Sabha with the Brahma Samaj and that resulted to consolidated effort towards religious reforms of Hindu faith. Hindu faith. After this, another major reformer emerged in Bengal that is Ishwar Chand Vidya Sagar who started a campaign in favor of widow remarriages in India. And due to the effort of Ishwar Chand Vidya Sagar only, British legalized widow remarriages in the year 1856. All this happened in Bengal. In the province of Bengal, a very prominent movement was started known as the Young Bengal Movement. Why? A European that is Henry Vivian de Rosio. Henry Vivian de Rosio believed in the ideals of French Revolution that is liberty, equality and fraternity. And with the help of his students and young people, he started a movement known as the Young Bengal Movement to modernize Indian society. Apart from these reformers, there was another major reformer that is Dhyanand Saraswati or Swami Dhyanand Saraswati. Swami Dhyanand Saraswati was originally named as Mool Shankar and Swami Dhyanand Saraswati wanted to revive Hinduism. Raja Ram Mohan Rai wanted to reform Hinduism. Dhyanand Saraswati wanted to revive Hinduism. So Hindu reform movements also got divided into two branches that is revivalist and reformist. As a revivalist, Dhyanand Saraswati wanted to focus on Vedas and its utility and therefore he gave the slogan of go back to the Vedas. Swami Dhyanand Saraswati established an organization known as R. Samaj in 1875 to revive Hindu faith and to promote education among the students in India. Clear? Apart from Dhyanand Saraswati, other major works towards social reform movements were to work towards against Sati in favor of video remarriage, against child marriage child marriage. Sati was basically a practice whereby widow was supposed to burn herself on the funeral part of the husband and campaign was against Sati was started by Raja Ramo and Roy and British declared Sati to be illegal in Bengal in 1829. 
video image was promoted by so Iswachan Vidya Sagar and an act was made by British in the year 1856. Child marriage was pro prohibited by a large number of Indian reformers which was supported even by British through legislation in the year 1895. All these were social and religious reform movements largely confined to Hindu society. But at the same time, Islamic revivalism also began to take place in 19th century. The first major rev Islamic revivalism was started by, started in the form of Razi movement in the extreme, the north extreme northern part of India. In the Farazi movement, Islamic revivalism and focus on Quran and Hadith was emphasized by Muslim scholars in India. Wahhabi movement was started by Shah Abdul Wahhab in the Saudi Arabia and it was popularized in India in the northwestern part of India. Wahhabi movement was basically to revive Islamic religion in India, but it also focused on conversion to Islamic faith. Wahhabi movement came into conflict with British in Punjab and Wahhabis were totally persecuted by British that marked the end of Wahhabi movement within a short period of time. So Islamic revivalism also took place in the 19th century. We we'll look into some questions asked in the, from this topic. Ram Mohan Roy presents a most instructive and inspiring study for the new India of which is the type and pioneer comment. As we had discussed, Raja Ram Mohan Roy is considered to be the father of modern India, father of Indian Renasa. He was the most instructive and inspiring study because he was the first one of New India, which is the type and pioneer. He represented the New India and he was the pioneer because all social reform movement, religious reform movement, even the growth and development of press was pioneered by him. So he was the type and he was the pioneer of New India or modern India in the 19th century. Swami Dhanan's philosophy represents both elements of extremism and social radicalism. Swami Dhanan Saraswati basically wanted to revive Hinduism and therefore he showed certain amount of extremism and social radicalism. For instance, Swami, under the guidance of Swami Dhanan Saraswati, in order to revive Hinduism, a movement was started which is known as the Shuddhi movement or purification movement. As per this movement, any person who had been converted to other religious faith like Christianity, Islam, they were asked to revert back to Hinduism. And therefore, this is termed as a great move towards Hindu revivalism and consolidation. It proved it to be highly extreme and socially radical because it was criticized by members of other religious faith. These, was, these are some questions asked in the previous year from the topic that is social and religious reform movements. Now, all these when developments were taking place, how did Indians respond to the British rule is the next topic that is Indian response to British rule. An Indian response was in the form of peasant movement, tribal movements in different parts of India. We'll look into such response. As we had discussed that British wanted to maximize their commercial profit in India, they introduced land revenue settlements, they went for deindustrialization that led to landless agrarian laborers, it resulted in impoverishment of people, famine in different parts of India. All these led to huge grievances among the peasants and peasants began to launch uprisings or movement against the British rule. Several peasant movements took place at this time clear and these peasant movements challenged British authority but much more radical and sporadic in nature were the tribal movements. When British began to enter into tribal pockets like Chota Nagpur Belt in India, tribals reacted vehemently or strongly because tribals wanted to enjoy autonomy that they had been enjoying since ancient times. Clear? And therefore, this led into major revolts like Rangpur Ding. Rangpur Ding is located, Rangpur located in Eastern Bengal, right now located in Bangladesh. Rang, at Rangpur, large number of peasants and even tribal revolted against British policies that led to the that led to the impoverishment. Kolap rebellion took place. Mopla rebellion, very prominent. Mopla rebellion took place in the region of Malabar in modern Kerala, which was largely started by Muslim peasants who were dominated by Hindu zamindars. Then Santhal hole, very prominent. It took place in the region of Chotanagpur belt. And in the Santhal hole, it was led by two brothers, Siddhu and Kanhu in 1855. Santhal rebellion was very prominent as with traditional weapons only they fought British for relatively longer period of time. Even though Santhal rebellion was suppressed, it proved to be a precedent for a mighty revolt 
that took place in 1857. Indigo Rebellion took place as we had discussed that commercialization was introduced by British in agriculture. They forced Indian peasants to cultivate indigo which was used for coloring or dyeing clothes and therefore large number of peasants who were forced to cultivate indigo at the cost of producing food grains, these peasants began to revolt and Indigo Rebellion became a regular feature against the British rule. Deccan uprising took place in the entire region of Deccan just because of British exploitative policies. These are examples of tribal revolts that took place under British rule in India. Apart from this, Munda Ungulan took place because Munda Ungulan also took place in the region of Chota Nagpur belt that is modern Jharkhand which was led by Birsa Munda and it is locally termed as Ulgulan or revolt which was led by a very prominent warrior Munda who is also considered to be semi-god among the tribal people of Jharkhand presently. Apart from all these pocketed response, one major development against British took place in the form of the mighty revolt of 1857. What were the reasons? Reasons were basically the economic exploitation of British, capital expan political expansion of British in India, social religious policies that affected the sentiments of people in India. All these factors combined together resulted into mighty revolt in the northern and central part of India. The character is discussed by historians largely. Some scholars believe, or British authority largely believe, it was only a mutiny led by. Indian soldiers, but it is not largely accepted. Even though started by Indian soldiers, it was largely supported by the peasantry class. Therefore, it was a popular revolt. Clear? So, all these major characters or features define the revolt of 1857. But this revolt in northern and central part of India was crushed by the British with the superior military strength due to lack of coordination among the leaders. And after the revolt of 1857, British adopted for the reactionary policies and in order to rule continuously over India, they enacted a very prominent act known as the Government of India Act 1858. In the, under the consequences, British increased the proportion of European forces as compared to India to prevent the occurrence of any other revolt in coming time. The, apart from this, peasant movements continued in the first half of the 20th century and it was largely under the guidance of the national leaders of India because by the beginning of 20th century, Indian national movement also began in order to challenge British rule over Indian territory. This was major developments in under, in, under Indian response to British rule. What are the questions asked from this topic in the previous year? Critically examine the nature of the revolt of 1856. It, some say that it was basically a mutiny. Some scholars of the opinion it was popular. Some say that it was guided by national sentiment. Some say it was guided only by parochial sentiments. How did it affect the British policy in India after the period? British became more reactionary to an educated class. British became more reactionary towards Indian rulers. And the British became more reactionary towards Indian uh, Muslim rulers because most of the participants were Muslim rulers at this point of time. The mutiny of 1857 was much more than a mutiny of surprise and much less than a national rebellion. This is on the nature of the revolt of 1857. It said that it was more than a mutiny because it was not only supported by the Indian soldiers even though they were started, they started this. But at the same time, it was also not a national rebellion because feeling of nationalism, India as a nation was not, to, not there at this time. So largely they were guided by parochial sentiments, but at the same time, it was more than a mere mutiny. But huh, it fell short of being a pure national agitation of India. Apart from this, now we'll move on to the next topic that is Indian national movement. And the first topic is Indian nationalism. Politics of Association, Foundation of Indian National Congress, Septi Balthas is clear. Now, Indian National Movement, very important topic for your examination. As far as Indian National Movement is concerned, it started with politics of association as Indians began to unite, to come together. That is resulting to establishment of several organizations like the Prarthana Samaj, the Madras Mahajan Sabha, the Bombay Association, and all this clubbed together by the end of 1885, a national or political organization was established in the form of Indian National Congress. The first annual session of Indian National Congress was convened at Bombay in December 1885. With respect to formation of Indian National Congress, a theory is given by a historian known as the safety wall thesis. Clear? According to the thesis, scholars or leaders like Lala Lajpat Rai claim that Indian National Congress was basically established to serve British interest in India. And why this theory? Because you know, because the idea of establishing the National Congress was given by a retired British civil servant, 
A O U. But scholars like Bipin Chandra claim that Indian National Congress cannot be explained only on the safety wall thesis because Indian leaders were of the opinion that with support of British civil, civil servant that is A O U, at least Indian National Movement will start in a rudimentary fashion, and in the long run, we can be more vocal in nature to demand genuine rights against British rule over. Indian territory. So safety wall theories cannot be is not appropriate to or adequate enough to explain the formation of Indian National Congress. Programs and objectives of early Congress. Early Congress were dominated by leaders who were termed as moderates because they believed in moderate programs and objectives. Their objective was basically to develop India into a nation. And in order to develop into a nation, they adopted programs like educating Indians. They began to write pamphlets. They began to write letters. They began to write other things just to educate Indians in the long run to understand that they belong to a common nation rather than sticking only to the caste and creed at this time. The social composition of early Congress leadership, Congress initially comprised of the higher caste in India, especially Brahmins, and professionally, Congress was dominated largely by the lawyers or the advocates who were highly educated at this time, who wanted to lead in national movement in an effective manner. At the same time, moderates who dominated the early Congress, they believed in maintaining law and order and in educating Indians towards nationalism. But in course of time, apart from moderates, radical leaders also emerged who believed in mass agitation against the British. These leaders, in contrast to moderates, are known as extremists. The most prominent extremist leader being Pal Gangadhar Tilak, supported by Pipin Chandrapal and Lala Lajpat Rai. They believe that until this mass agitation started against the British, no major objectives can be achieved that differentiated them from the approach of the moderates. Clear? Meanwhile, when all these developments were taking place, British, in order to weaken the rising nationalism, decided to divide the most active province of India, that is, Bengal. And Bengal was divided in the year 1905 by Lord Curzon, clear. The idea given by British was that they were dividing Bengal basically for proper administration as Bengal was a large province at that point of time. But at the same time, the real motive was to create religious divide among the people of Bengal. They divided Bengal into the eastern and western part of Bengal because eastern part of Bengal had majority of Muslim population, western part of Bengal had majority of Hindu population. This division was done and in order to oppose such religious division of Bengal, the leaders of international movement started the first major agitation known as the Swadeshi and the Boycott Movement. The Swadeshi and Boycott Movement was started against the partition of Bengal in 1905 and it continued almost for three years. But British succeeded in dividing the people across religious lines because during the course of Swadeshi movement only in 1906, a religious and communal organization in the form of the Muslim League was established in 1906. And Muslims began to keep themselves aloof from this movement and ultimately at the height of Swadeshi movement, communal rights broke out in Bengal. That largely facilitated British to check this movement to rather stop this movement. So the Swadeshi movement came to an end in this way. At the same time, when Swadeshi movement ended without achieving any major objective, the youths of Bengal started to feel discontented and therefore they adopted third major approach and the third major approach was to adopt the violent methods against British officers in order to create fear among them to achieve their objectives and revolutionary activities began to take place in Bengal the first major in the year 1908 when Raj Bihari Bose and Prafula Chaki decided to annex British officer this marked the beginning of revolutionary extremism in India so moderates believed in maintaining perfect law and order and agitating within the four walls of law. Extremists believed in passive resistance and mass agitation. And revolutionary extremism believed in violent actions against British authority. This was Indian national, this was about Indian nationalism. Now we look into some questions asked in the previous year. Significance of the Swadeshi movement 1905 to 1907 in the freedom struggle. Swadeshi movement is important because the most important aspect of this movement was that national leaders at this time promoted indigenous goods and services. The most important feature being 
indigenous character was highlighted at this time in the province of Bengal to create faith and confidence among people in Bengal. And as a mark of this only, at this only, Rabindranath Tagore, who was a Bengali poet at this time, composed Amar Sunar Bangla to highlight the rich legacy and tradition of Bengal. At the same time, Vande Matram was popularized at this time by Bankim Chand Chattopadhyay. During this only, then paintings were promoted on national themes. All this resulted into cultural growth and development on indigenous lines or Swadeshi at this time. Not only this, during Swadeshi movement, British goods were boycotted at this time, which was a big development during this movement. All this resulted into huge confidence among masses to stand on the feet against British domination. Next is discuss the safety wall theory. Does it satisfactorily explain the foundation of International Congress? We have discussed right now only. Safety wall theory was given because of the association of retired British civil servant AOU who gave the concrete idea of International Congress. But safety wall theory cannot explain the formation of International Congress completely as Bipin Chandra, Bipin Chandra argues that International Congress was established on, as a culmination of political awareness that was taking place in India since the revolt of 1857 and at the same time Indian leaders wanted to use Yeo Hume to offset any sense of fear among the British so as to start national movement on a slow but gradual and steady pace against British authority in India. So safety wall theory cannot be considered to be adequate enough to explain the formation of Indian National Congress. Now we will move to another topic of modern India and that is Gandhian era. The coming of Mahatma Gandhi and era started under his rule. Gandhian nationalism and popular appeal, Lord Satyagraha, Khilafat movement and so on. Mahatma Gandhi was a basically barrister who originally belonged to the province of Gujarat. After, after attaining a degree in law, he wanted to practice in India. Clear? And at the same time, when he wanted to practice in India, he came to India at the age of 40 years, 46 years in 1915. When he came to India, he began to move across Indian territory to understand Indian situation at this time. While he was roaming around, across in, while he was moving across Indian territory, Mahatma Gandhi basically started local agitation against British exploitation. The first Satyagraha started by him was Champaran Satyagraha in the region of North Bihar, then followed by the Satyagraha in the region of Heda in the region in Gujarat and then Ahmedabad as well. So Champaran, Ahmedabad and Heda were local experiments of Mahatma Gandhi between the year 1915 to 1919. And in all these movements, he showed his technique of mass agitation that led to his huge popularity and he became highly popular among the masses. At the same time, Mahatma Gandhi began to oppose an important legislation of British known as the Rowlett legislation, whereby British decided to arrest any person on grounds of suspicion, which was highly arbitrary in nature. At the same time, Mahatma Gandhi supported Khilafat movement as during the First World War going on in the European world, in the European world, Muslim masses in the world, including India, demanded proper treatment should be given to Khalifa or the rule of Turkey, who was considered to be political and spiritual head of Muslims in India. But since Khilafat or Khalifa was not given a proper treatment after First World War, Muslims were filled with grievances and Khilafat movement was also supported by Mahatma Gandhi. And ultimately, Mahatma Gandhi decided to launch the first mass agitation against the British in the form of the non-cooperation movement in the year 1920. Clear? What was the immediate reason? Apart from Rolex Satyagraha and Klaapad movement, the immediate reason was that in the year 1919, Jalia Wala Bagh massacre took place in which innocent Sikh masses, women and children were assassinated by the British in the region of Amritsar. Since British were not ready to apologize for this act, Mahatma Gandhi decided to launch first mass movement in the form of non-cooperation movement. It continued for two years. From 1920 to 1922, Mahatma Gandhi announced the withdrawal of this movement in 1922, exactly on 12th of February 1922, because of an incident that took place at Chauri Chaura in the region of Gorakhpur in Uttar Pradesh, whereby large number of British soldiers or British police were killed because masses retaliated against police action at Chauri Chaura. After the end of the non-cooperation movement, Mahatma Gandhi went on to support mass agitation in India. At the same time, he launched another mass movement in the year 1913 in the form of the Civil Disobedience Movement. 
It continued in two phases from 1930 to 32 and from 1932 to 1934. What was the immediate reason for civil disobedience movement? Mahatma Gandhi basically wanted to make certain acts in India legal in nature. And this was for a form, this was, in this, some, the one major thing was he wanted to make manufacture of salt a legal act. Therefore, since British wanted to monopolize the production of salt, which was a major, major item of consumption, it resulted into conflict. And with Salt March, at this time, Mahatma Gandhi announced the launch of civil disobedience movement in 1930. It continued for 1932, supported by a large number of people, the most prominent being Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan in the northwestern part of India, also known as Frontier Gandhi, Si Rajagopalachari in the province of Madras, and in other parts of India. In 1932, Mahatma Gandhi suspended this movement as he decided to participate in the Round Table Conference convened by the British in London. But since no major positive outcome took place in the Round Table Conference, Mahatma Gandhi returned back in 1932 and resumed civil disobedience movement that continued till the year 1934 when it was formally withdrawn at this time. Meanwhile, by all these developments were taking place, Simon Commission came to India. This Simon Commission was opposed by Indian leaders because none of the Indian members were included in this commission. And after this only, Moti Lal Nehru sub submitted a report whereby under this Nehru report, he wanted Indian participation in administration. Roundtable conferences began to take place in London. Three sessions of roundtable conferences took place, the third being in the year 1932, again without major leaders of Congress party. And as a result of this conference only, British enacted a comprehensive legislation known as the Government of India Act 1935. We'll discuss that later on. Meanwhile, peasant movement continued to take place, working class movement to continue to take place, which was also supported by Mahatma Gandhi. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi was the first leader to start working class movement in India when he established Ahmedabad Mill Association to protect the interest of workers at this time. Peasant movement continued to take place, supported by Mahatma Gandhi at this time, that was largely in the province of United Province and in the province of Bihar at this time. These developments took place apart from this, these developments under Gandhian era, during Gandhian era, women, youth and students participated actively in Indian politics. Then in the Gandhian era, election of 1937 took place, whereby provincial elections were held in all the 11 British ruled provinces at this time. And in this election, Congress was able to form ministries in nine provinces, whereby they introduced several progressive reforms. And after this only, then Second World War took place in 1939. In 1939, British wanted to take the Indian support during Second World War. They dispatched Crips mission in the year 1940, but Crips mission was not successful. At the same time, Mahatma Gandhi became highly impatient as Japan began to attack India from the north eastern side of India and out of due to this atmosphere Mahatma Gandhi launched his third mass movement known as the Quit India movement in the year 1942. This Quit India movement was launched in the year 1942 but before this movement could actually start British arrested all the major national leaders of India, masses were left leaderless and masses became violent in nature. So Quit India movement turned out to be violent and spontaneous in character. After by the end of second world war Lord Wevel gave his plan known as Wevel Plan, whereby he wanted to you he wanted to ensure collaboration between Muslim League and Congress Party, as by this time communalism became a major challenge. Finally, cabinet mission came to India after the end of Second World War, and with this cabinet mission plan in 1946, transfer of power was started to be given. And with this transfer of power, only it was decided India would be divided into two independent states of India and Pakistan. Meanwhile, Another mutiny took place in the year 1946 known as the Rin Mutiny whereby the Indian officers of Royal Indian Navy revolted against the British under the leadership of M.S. Khan. And just because of this revolt only, British realized no, they cannot sustain the rule because they relied largely on Indian military soldiers, naval officers to rule over India. The Rin Mutiny is also considered to be the last nail in the coffin to bury British rule in India. Clear? This was Rin Mutiny and Cabinet Mission Plan. Now, some questions asked from this topic, Gandhi and Iran examination. The Crips Mission gave India a post-dated check. Yeah. Why is it that to be a post-dated check? Because under the Crips Mission, British made clear that India would be given or India would be given autonomy 
after in the end of second world war now no one knew when the second world war would come to an end therefore jawaharlal nehru and the leaders termed it to be a post dated check that is check that could not be honored at this time check that was to be honored after the second world war but no one knew how to, when the second world war would come to an end so it was a kind of a post dated check in the summer of 1942 gandhi was in a strained and uniquely militant mood as we had discussed by the year 1942 when second world war was going on japan started a fascist power started to attack in british and they entered even into the region of northeastern that is near impal in manipur mahatma gandhi became impatient as india was about to fell into trap of a fascist power out of impatient and militant mood mahatma gandhi announced the launch of his third mass movement in the form of the quick india movement but due to the rest of major national leaders the movement turned out to be violent and spontaneous and it became very easy for the british to suppress this movement within a matter of few months these were major developments during gandhian era now we'll move on to the next major topic that is the constitutional developments in colonial india between 1858 and 1935 we'll look into major acts very important act the government of india act 1858 it was enacted just after the mighty revolt of 1857 whereby the rule of british east india company was abolished and british crown decided to rule over india directly from London clear at the same time the post of governor general of india was abolished and in his place viceroy was appointed with who was considered to be direct representative of british crown in india so this person was termed as governor general of india when he looked after indian administration this post was termed as viceroy in india when he acted as on behalf of british crown in india thereafter major acts were enacted within india to look after indian affairs since they were enacted within india they are known as indian councils act the first council act in 1861 then 1891 and then indian council act of 1909 which was based on morley minto reforms and under this indian council act of 1909 only a cardinal blunder was done when principle of separate electorates for muslims was introduced in india by the british to divide indians across along religious lines ultimately finally government of india act was enacted by british parliament whereby it was decided to introduce a kind of diary in india whereby the subjects were to be divided into transferred and reserved categories after government of india act 1919 the most comprehensive legislation was enacted in the year 1935 as a part of the deliberation of the third round table conference in 1932 government of india act 1935 is highly comprehensive in nature that decided to provide provincial autonomy in india along with centralized control in fact government of india act 1935 has been taken into indian constitution as well in fact indian constitution also termed as the carbon copy of the government of india act 1935 and finally british parliament enacted the indian independence act of 1947 whereby india was granted independence india became an independent nation and at the same time india got divided into two independent states of countries of india and pakistan apart from this we we'll look into other stands of international movement first of all we we'll look into questions asked on this topic the reforms of 1909 introduced a cardinal problem ground of controversy to every revision of the indian electoral system yes because it introduced the principle of separate electorates for muslims in india and why it is said it became controversial every revision of indian electoral system why because after 1909 when separate electorates were given to muslims in the government of india act 1919 the same thing was awarded to other sections like anglo indians also christians also and sikhs also and finally it was again revised in the year 1935 to give such principal separate electorates to scheduled caste or dalit community in india therefore cardinal problem introduced in 1909 that became a controversy at every revision of indian electoral system next question is in terms of the administrative structure the government of india act 1850 meant more continuation than change do you agree yeah after the mighty revolt of 1857 british parliament introduced the government of india act 1858 to prevent the occurrence of any such revolt like the revolt of 1857 therefore it was full of reactionary measures as per government of india act 1858 british crown took the responsibility to rule over india but no major change was introduced at the ground level at the same time even though viceroy was appointed still he was termed as governor general of india when he looked after proper administration therefore in terms of administrative structure the government of india acting for which meant more continuation that existed from earlier time rather than change why because british wanted to rule over india even after the mighty revolt of 1857
clear now we will move to next topic that is other stands in the national movement revolutionaries clear as we had discussed that revolutionary extremism started after the failure of the Swadesh movement first of all started in Bengal by Raj Bihari Bose and Prapul Chake later on revolutionaries were started to in the province of Punjab the most important revolution of Punjab being Sardar Bhagat Singh who challenged British authority on scientific principles clear revolutionaries started also in the province of Maharashtra and then United Province United Province leaders like Chandra Shekhar Azad who even led Vasadar Bhagat Singh against British authority. In the province of Madras also revolution emerged and even outside India. Outside India, the most important revolutionary outbreak was in the form of Gadar movement that took place in the United States and Canada. Outside India, revolutionaries also began to emerge in the region of Britain or London, where several unpopular British officers were assassinated by Indian revolutionaries. Another major stand of national movement was rise of the left. Left means rise of socialist and communist ideology in the course of national movement. And rise of left largely took place as a consequence of the successful Russian revolution of 1917. And within this rise of concept of rise of left, two important socialist leaders emerged in India, Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhash both And both supported the rise of peasant movement and working class movement to give more the broad based character to Indian national movement. Congress Socialist Party was also established in 1934 by leaders like Jay Prakash Narayan, Ram Manohar Lohia and other prominent leaders. Communist Party of India was established after Russian Revolution in the year 1920. Within India, the announcement of Communist Party of India was done by Satya Bhag at Kanpur in the year 1925. These are terms as rise of left within Indian national movement. Clear? Now we look into questions related to rise of left or other stands. Account for the rise and growth of left wing within the Congress, that is Socialist Party, that is Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhash Chandra Bose. Did Jawaharlal Nehru believe in socialist approach to India and world problems? And if so, why? Yeah, Jawaharlal based on rise and growth of left wing ideology. It took place because to make Congress highly acceptable and broad based in nature, they supported present and working class movement, and it was largely because of successful Russian revolution supported by peasants and workers in Russia within the Congress. Did Jawaharlal Nehru believe in socialist approach? Totally, he filmed, firmly believed in socialist approach to solve Indian problem and the world problem. Clear? Indian problem because he wanted to realize without the support of the peasantry class, the working class, Indian national movement would become meaningless in character. And to world problems because after the end of Second World War, Jawaharlal Nehru realized that the in the developing countries like India should not align either with the capitalist bloc or the communist bloc, rather it should maintain a equal distance from the two power blocks to ensure development and therefore he gave the policy of non-alignment. Clear? The ideology of Subhash Chandra Bose was a combination of nationalism, fascism and communism. Subhash Chandra Bose wanted to ensure India's independence through nationalism, fascism because he believed basically that India should be liberated by any means. So unlike Mahatma Gandhi who believed in means and ends, Mahatma Jawaharlal both believed only in end. He was he never cared for means. So he even wanted to take the support of Hitler to liberate India and communism also because Jawaharlal both realized that in order to establish society on equality, even if violence and revolution is required, it has to be undertaken to ensure India's equitable distribution, equitable growth and development. These are some questions asked from the topic that is other stands in the national movement. Now we'll move on to the next topic of modern India. That is politics of separatism. Politics of separatism or communalism. Muslim League, Hindu Mahasabha, communalism, politics of partition, transfer of power and independence. Clear? As we discussed that all India Muslim League was established during the Swadeshi movement in 1906. And thereafter, all India Muslim League led by leaders like Aga Khan, they began to support interest of Muslim community in India. Out of, out of this response only, Hindu Mahasabha was established. The first session of Hindu, Sabha, Hindu Mahasabha convened under the leadership of Raja of Banaras in 1915. And with the establishment of Muslim League and Hindu Mahasabha, communism began to emerge rapidly. Communism also took place because of principle of separate electorates guaranteed to Muslims under Indian Council Act of 1909. Reli differences on the basis of religion result into a new trend known as communalism in India. And communalism began to be promoted by some leaders in the international movement, the most prominent being 
Muhammad Ali Jinnah on behalf of Muslim community. And Muhammad Ali Jinnah only began to demand partition of India, that is a creation of separate Muslim state within Indian territory. And this resulted into politics of partition. And therefore, when transfer of power was being done, British authority divided India into two independent states of India and Pakistan in 1947. So independence was accompanied with trans, not only transfer of power, but division of Indian territory into two separate nation states. Clear? Now, question asked from this topic, discuss as to why the Congress accepted the partition of India in 1947. Congress was forced to accept the partition of India in 1947 because of high sense of communism that resulted into killing of large number of innocent masses in India. Since large number of civilians began to be killed because of communal carnage, in the National Congress realized that if required, let us accept the partition of India just to save the lives of common in just to save the lives of innocent masses in India. That is why by the year 1947, Congress realized it is better to accept the partition of India rather than to witness the massacre of people on every streets of India. Why did the British finally quit India on 15th August 1947? Because by this time, British realized no, it is not possible to rule over India. And more importantly, I'll let you know. After the end of Second World War, United Nations organization came into being and United Nations asked all the colonial powers that is Britain to liberate the colonies as soon as possible. Possible. The imperialist answer is that independence was simply the fulfillment of British self-appointment mission to assist the Indian people to self-government. According to imperial point of view, it is said that British wanted to liberate India because Britain finally wanted to develop India into or assist India to rule themselves. But this imperialist viewpoint is not accepted. British was forced to leave India to grant independence to India under the pressure of global powers like United Nations and at the same time due to continued pressure of Indian leaders through Indian national movement. Clear? This was about Indian national movement. In our modern India slivers, we have topics related to post-independence also. We'll move, to, move on to that. Clear? First major topic in post-independence is consolidation as a, as a nation. Nehru's foreign policy, India and their neighbors, linguistic reorganization of states, regionalism and regional inequality. Jawaharlal Nehru who became the first Prime Minister of independent India. He was also the head of or rather headed the he headed the foreign portfolio. He was the foreign minister as well. He drafted India's foreign policy as well as uh, foreign policy. And with his foreign policy, with emphasis on principles like punchil and non-alignment, Nehru first of all focused to establish relationship with neighboring countries. Nehru tried to build relationship first of all with Pakistan also. Nehru tried to build relationship with Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan and other major countries as well. So Nehru's foreign policy was guided by huge amount of recognition as well as huge amount of accommodation to accommodate neighboring countries because India was the largest country area wise and population wise. So Nehru wanted to give a feeling of trust to all the neighboring countries. Clear? Then at the same time after India's independence demand began to arose that India needs to be reorganized into states on linguistic criteria. This demand first of all arose from the from the Telugu speaking people in southern part of India. As a result of this demand and continuous pressure on Indian government, finally India accepted linguistic reorganization of states in India. The first state to be created on linguistic criteria was Andhra Pradesh in the year 1953. Later on, linguistic criteria was applied while creating the states of Gujarat and Maharashtra also after bifurcating the province of Bombay. It continued till recent times whereby in the year 2000, linguistic states or Hindi speaking states of Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand and Jharkhand were carved out from states like other states, other states like Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Clear? Regionalism, regional equality also persisted side by side. Some states were meant to be highly developed like Maharashtra and Gujarat. Other states like Bihar and Rajasthan could not develop. This regionalism, this created the feeling of regionalism and regional inequality that even affected peace and security after India's independence. Clear? This was, these are major topics. Again, other major topics were Other major topics are integration of princely states as well. Okay. Now, princely states were integrated by the first Home Minister of India, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Okay. 
with great skill and masterful diplomacy and using both persuasion pressure, Sadar Vallabh Bhai Patel succeeded in integrating hundreds of princely states within Indian Union. Yes, Sadar Vallabh Bhai Patel being the first Home Minister of India or Deputy Prime Minister of India, he wanted to integrate large number of princely states. When India became independent, India became independent only with British India. But at the same time, apart from British India, there were more than 568 independent princely states. Princely states like Hyderabad, Kashmir, Junagar and so on. And Sadar Vallabh Bhai Patel with his policy of pressure and persuasion was able to integrate all these princely states including Kashmir, Junagar, Hyderabad, Manipur and so on. Therefore, this became a major development in post-independent era and India emerged to be a union of states due to the contribution of Sardar Vallabh Bhai Patel. Next question is, during Nehru's policy of non-alignment came to symbolize the struggle of India and other newly independent nations to retain and strengthen the independence from colonialism. Non-alignment, Nehru advocated non-alignment just because to maintain equidistance from the Cold War era between the Communist bloc headed by USSR or Russia and Capitalist bloc headed by uh, America or United States. In Nehru advocated this policy because newly independent countries wanted to focus more on socio-economic development rather than focus on race for armament which was in the era of Cold War being done by all the aligned countries with the cold, with the capitalist bloc or the communist bloc at this time. So Nehru's policy of non-alignment came to symbolize the struggle of India, that is this country and newly independent countries, newly independent countries like the country like Egypt, country like Sri Lanka and to retain the strength and the independence from colonialism. They never wanted to align with colonial power like United States or colonial power like other countries. So they wanted to maintain equidistance from the two power blocks which was feasible through the policy of non alignment given by Nehru and supported by other leaders like Abdul Nasser of Egypt, President Sukarno of Indonesia and so on. Clear? This was major development in post-independent era. Next major topic in post-independent era is caste and ethnicity after 1947. Backward caste types, electoral politics and Dalit movement. Clear? After India's, move, India's independence only, concept of backward caste began to be advocated by some leaders and the most important development with this respect was the Janta government that came into power in 1977 led by Muraji Desai resulted from, began to promote the concept of backward caste. It resulted into a very important commission known as the Mandal Commission. Under the chairmanship of J.P. Mandal, a member of parliament from Bihar. And according to Mandal Commission, reservation was demanded for backward caste to be identified on economic basis and on the basis of social backwardness. Backward caste movement began to take place and ultimately OBCs or the backward caste were given reservation in 1993 during the regime of B.P. Singh government. Clear? Tribes also, large number of tribes were to be integrated. Jawaharlal Nehru advocated the policy of Panchil, that five principles of coexistence whereby tribes were to be peacefully integrated with the mainstream population in India. Electoral politics began to take place whereby politics or elections began to be fight, fought on regular interval, that is after every five years. Dalit movement began to be advocated in post-independent era. The first major leader after independence being Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar belonged to the Mahar caste in Maharashtra and under the leadership of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar only scheduled caste or Dalit movement began to take place effectively. After the death of, the death of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Dalit movement was advocated by other leaders in course of time. It became a major point of controversy in India and ultimately Dalit capitalism was advocated by the end of the 20th century that basically advocated Dalit participation in capitalist system and corporate system in order to upgrade the social and economic status in Indian society. This was caste ethnicity. We'll look into some question. Discuss the factors that led to the growth of Dalit consciousness and mention the major movements aimed at the empowerment. Clear? The factor was continued backwardness of Dalit Indian society and another major factor was the consciousness arose by leaders like Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar started Dalit consciousness and at the same time when he realized that Dalit consciousness is not possible in Hindu society, he got converted into Buddhist religion and started a new Buddhist sect known as Navyan at this time. Major movement started thereafter, even after the death of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, movements continue to take place in course of time. A major development taking place in Central India, that is at Bhopal, where the concept of Dalit capitalism was advocated in course of time for the empowerment of Dalit society. Okay. 
Next major topic is, and the last topic is, economic development, political change in modern India after independence. The first major development was land reforms. Clear? India realized, Indian leaders realized that all the lands got confined to the zamindari class, largely in the British rule. So land needs to be taken back and distributed among the farmers of the peasantry class. Without land reforms, equality was not a feasible society, feasible option. And therefore, Indian Parliament began to enact legislations whereby ceilings were fixed and land reforms were started. But land reforms were also started on voluntary basis by a very prominent Gandhian leader, Achar Vinoba Bhave, who started the movement known as Bhudan and Gramdan, whereby he wanted voluntary surrender of land in favor of landless peasants so that equality could be established in Indian society. Moreover, for economic growth and development, Jawaharlal Nehru started an era of planning whereby five-year plans began to be formulated and implemented. The first five-year plan being implemented in the year 1951 with focus on agriculture, growth and development. Clear? Since then, planning became a regular feature that resulted to economic development in India. Rural construction was focused whereby large number of cottage industries were planned in the rural areas so that community participation can be ensured and development on a holistic level can be done. Ecology and environment, large number amount of ecological consciousness began to take place in post-independent era and therefore several schemes like Project Tiger in the year 1973, Project Elephant, all these began to be launched in course of time. Movement also began to be launched in order to ensure ecological and environmental security, the first major being the Chipko movement in the region of Uttarakhand. And since then only Jungle Bachao Andolan and finally the Narmada Bachao Andolan were launched by leaders like Medha Patkar in order to arouse ecological and environmental consciousness in post-independent era. In post-independent era, scientific progress was also ensured with government efforts with establishment of Department of Science and Technology in India. Yeah. At the same time, development in the field of atomic energy, development in the form of space through ISRO, development in the form of nuclear energy, all these began to take place in post-independent era. And till now, India achieved several milestones in the scientific growth and development. Some questions related to economic growth and development. Number first is 2015. Question asked was Jawaharlal Nehru, though a declared socialist, was a pragmatic enough to focus on providing building blocks to the making of a new India. Even though being a socialist leader in the course of national movement, Nehru was highly practical or pragmatic in nature to provide building blocks onto the making of new India. Building blocks included he began to promote large number of industries in India, especially the coal industry, especially other industries as well. And these industries were established with support of <coughs> European powers. So he was pragmatic enough to take the support of foreign powers to establish building blocks. Jawaharlal Nehru even promoted multi-purpose multi projects like Bhakra Nangal project at the same time other projects in different parts of India. And with this multi-purpose projects like Damodar project, Bhakra Nangal project, he was able to ensure building blocks to India rather than lying only on socialist principle. So apart from being ideologically a socialist leader, he was practical enough to take the support of other countries to promote building blocks to making of making of new India in post-independent era. These are major topics or these are all the topics of modern India of paper 2 of history optional along with discussions of some major questions. Clear? This was about modern India. In the next video, I'll discuss the syllabus of world history, which is the second section of paper 2 of history optional syllabus. Thank you and enjoy yourself.